I hate to interrupt you, but you know, I thought maybe we'd have class. <laughs> All right, we are in Daniel chapter six. So just as a reference point, this is the uh, the last uh, part of the kind of historical record in Daniel, <clears throat> where we kind of go through Daniel's life. Uh, when we get to chapter seven next week, <clears throat> excuse me. We then look at uh, more of the prophetic part of Daniel and, and start looking into the future. Uh, so we'll really change gears when we get to next week. But this is the last of the kind of historical records, the last of the stories, if you will, uh, that we've uh, been through in Daniel. So again, we'll try to get through the whole chapter today, which uh, is always crazy to me. But because it's a story, it just kind of makes sense to kind of go through it. Um, so here in... Uh, here in chapter six, we now have uh, we now have Darius uh, in charge of the kingdom. Uh, Babylon has fallen. <clears throat> uh, we now have the Medes and Persians in charge. Um, you know what's interesting here is that uh, even though we've changed kings and kingdoms, uh, we still are talking about Daniel, right? We're still talking about God's people. Uh, we're still talking about how God works. Uh, kind of irrelevant to uh, a massive change in the kingdom. It just now, again, it goes back to um, what we saw when we were in chapter four, right? That, that, that the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn, right? That the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and we kind of see it play out here in uh, that Darius is now in charge of the kingdom. But uh, but Daniel is still a very important person in in, uh, in God's working and what he's trying mm-hmm. to accomplish. So we got this guy, Darius. What's interesting is there's no extra biblical data on Darius. Uh, he, his name does not come up in the history books. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a lot of speculation then about who he is. Uh, there's, there's some who say, well, maybe he was just appointed to rule in Babylon from, from Cyrus. Cyrus is the historical um, uh, person that uh, conquered Babylon and took over. So they're thinking maybe Darius. Darius was uh, somebody he just appointed to uh, to rule there in Babylon, <clears throat> where Daniel was. Maybe uh, uh, maybe he ruled in another part of the kingdom, and he uh, brought Daniel with him. Uh, and then the, another when uh, another uh, uh, way that they think about this is perhaps Darius is actually a title and not a name. You know, like king. He's uh, if you look over look down at uh, verse twenty eight in chapter six. It says, so this, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Um, <clears throat> there are some translations that instead of the word and, it says the word even. So in other words, you would have, uh, he prospered in the reign of Darius, even in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. In other words, they're naming him the same person. Right? It's just, uh, you could say they, they prospered in the reign of the king and the reign of Cyrus the Persian, right? something like that. It could be that he's the Med- the Medo part of the Medo Persian. So, so there's a lot of options here, but uh, just to you know, just to be honest and clear, uh, it is unclear as to who this uh, Darius is. But obviously, uh, he he plays a very important part in uh, this story with Daniel. All right, so let's go into uh, let's go in uh, verse verse one. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might be might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss and then Daniel was distinguished amongst the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave him thought to setting him over the whole reign so here we have kind of the setup uh, Darius has uh, you know now in charge he sets up these satraps or governors or princes uh, depending on your translation over the whole kingdom. And then they had three uh, folks who were in charge of all of those, and these were called governors or something, uh, and Daniel was one of them. And then, uh, you know, in, in verse 3, he actually distinguished himself amongst even those, uh, um, as we see. So, again, you look in verse, uh, where is it, verse verse 3, he distinguished himself among the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit was in him. So again, you can't uh, think of this word spirit as being something with regard to something spiritual. It's more just saying the guy was sharp. Uh, he was smart. He knew what he was doing, and he had some experience. That's what they mean by that. Excuse me. Um, 
and and so that that's why they they put him in charge. Now you got to remember at this point in time, Daniel's probably in his nineties, right? This is way late in his uh, uh, his work with regard to the efforts in Babylon. Uh, he's in his nineties, but he's still very sharp. Uh, he's still someone that they want to have in in charge. Um, <clears throat> So the end of verse three, you notice that it says the the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So here he has uh, he has these three governors, uh, Daniel being one of those, uh, but he's thinking about actually putting him uh, in charge of the whole kingdom. Again, kind of in the way that he was with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar is kind of the the prime minister. Uh, Darius is thinking about doing the same thing with him. And in fact, there are some who speculate that this is maybe already underway. Uh, this may, you know, they may be starting to move in that direction. Uh, <clears throat> and so that, then we see the, the reaction of the, the, the rest of the group as we get into verse 4. So, so the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not, they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. So again, we see here that, you know, the envy of the governors right there, we're worried that Daniel's going to uh, be in charge of them. They don't want that. And so they start looking to see if they can find anything uh, in his history that they could find a, a charge against him or find fault in him, find out where he was not faithful to the king, etc. And I, frankly, it's just shocking, right, uh, that they find nothing. A 90 years of service and they find nothing to uh, go against him. Uh, you know, this is why I don't run for president. I don't want them digging into my background like this is no telling what they might find. But but here you see they dug into Daniel's background and they couldn't find anything. It's it's, it's you know you got to say that's a pretty amazing uh, amazing thing that's going on right there. The other thing just to mention is that um, you know Daniel grew up in a situation where you know as a teenager he's brought into this very uh, terrible situation where where uh, they don't honor his God they they uh, do all sorts of evil and. Uh, uh, sinfulness, you know, and still in the midst of that from, from age uh, 12, 15 or whatever to age 90, he, he never bows to it. Right? He never, it never becomes something that influenced his life. He's, he still be, stays pure. Uh, he, he, he doesn't allow it to, um, to change who he is. I, again, it's a great, it's not like he lived in a pristine society and that's how he could, uh, you know, stay pure. He was in the midst of a pretty terrible place. Um, and, and still he was able to uh, have a life that, that had found no charge against him. All right, verse 5. And then these men said, we shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God, right? So the, the other thing to recognize here is they recognized who Daniel was. They recognized the relationship he had with his God. Uh, and they said, well, the only thing that we, uh, we can find against him is because of his relationship with God. Um that would be a pretty awesome thing for someone to say about you, right? The only, the only thing we can find wrong with this guy is this relationship that he has with God. I think that's pretty profound. All right, verse, uh, where are we? Verse 5? Yeah, verse 5, no charge against him. So verse 6, so these governors and satraps throng, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against his concerning the law of God. And so these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. So before we get into what they say, uh, this, my, mine says they thronged before the king. I'm not sure what yours says. But this assembly that they had before the king, uh, many of the commentaries said this would be a very unusual thing. Uh, it, the throng means they, they came in in a hurry. They rushed in. This whole crowd of people rushed in to see the king. This would not be a normal thing and, frankly, uh, would not be looked upon well by the king uh, for these folks to come in. So it was, it's kind of surprising that they did this. Of course, they start out with the, uh, you know, King Darius live forever, right? The obligatory statement they've got to say right up front. And then in verse 7, it says, All the governors in the kingdom and the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute. And to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So again, um, verse 7, all the kings and governors of the kingdom, the administrators, etc. So is that a true statement? No, it is. 
It's obviously not, right? Because Daniel's not there. I'm having a little trouble hearing you guys. Maybe you just need to speak up or try it, right? Just let me say something. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're kind of in the background. Mm. Hello? How about now? Yeah, it's uh, still very quiet. I got my volume all the way up, and I'm still having trouble hearing from your side. But, okay, well, just know you have to speak up <laughs> in order for me to hear it. Yeah, I don't think turning our volume up is going to help. So where's the down button? All right, let's get back to it. So again, all the he says all the presidents, all the governors, right? And obviously that's not a true statement at all because Daniel's not involved, and he was not only one of the governors, he was the prime governor, and he he has not been involved in this. But but to the king, they say, oh, it's all of us. You know, we all agree this is something. But you know, so they're they're, they're making a false statement to the king. Uh, uh, they they hit him right in his point of vulnerability, right, which is his pride, right, saying, oh, listen, you know, we want you to be a god for 30 days, right, god for a day or god for 30 days. Everybody's going to bow down to you. So that, that hits him right in his pride. Uh, you know, he, his, his ego is being pumped up by these guys. And uh, and there you go to verse 9, right, there king, therefore King Darius signed and the written decree. So he signs it, he writes it. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he puts this decree in place. This last part is important in verse 8. But according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So there was a custom or a law that the Medes and Persians has that once the king made a decree, it could not be changed, not even by the king himself. The reason for that was they saw the king uh, as being someone who could not make a mistake. He was infallible. So if the king made a decree and then changed his mind, uh, that showed that he made a mistake, and then he could not be, you know, godlike if he makes mistakes. So they had this kind of custom or or law, if you, as, as it's stated here, that he could not he could not change his mind. So once he made this decree, uh, you know, it was written in stone, and it could not it could not really be changed. All right, let's go down to verse ten. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. All right, so Daniel hears about the decree, and what's his response? Disregard it. Yeah, no big deal. Right, I mean, he essentially just goes about his normal day. Right, There's no change because of uh, this decree that the, that the king has made. Um, so, so let me ask you a question. So he... Uh, He's in his upper room, windows open towards Jerusalem. He kneels down on his he, he kneels down on his knees three times a day. Does this sound like the Muslims to you? It, it does a little bit, right? So, so let me ask you this: Why is he praying towards Jerusalem? The temple was what? <laughs> <laughs> He's wanting to hear something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's where the temple was, but it's where God was, right? In their mind, that's where God lived, in the temple. So they're praying towards God. But why don't we do this today? Why don't we pray towards Jerusalem? Because God's not there. <laughs> God is, right? So I just wanted to get that in your head. So that's why they're praying towards Jerusalem. That's where they believe God was. We don't pray towards Jerusalem. So, so why three times a day? Morning, noon, and night shall I pray. Yeah, morning, noon, and night. This is, this is actually, if you go back through Scripture, all through the Old Testament, God talks about them saying that they should come before morning, noon, and night. So this is not, this is not something Muslim. This is something very, uh, very Jewish, uh, very Christian uh, for us to be praying. Uh, you know, in, in the New Testament, we talk about praying without ceasing, right? So this is this regular prayer. Uh, they prayed towards God, so th th there's really nothing unusual about uh, what we see Daniel doing here. I wanted to make sure you got that. Uh, now, I will, I, I will ask this. Um, so he doesn't change the pattern of his life, right? Um, but, but there is this new law in place. So he's made this decision that he's going to disobey the law of the king. Why? God is greater. God's law is more important. Yeah. I've got a higher so, faith. I'm just getting you to say things that are obvious, but sometimes that's important to get it locked in our heads. 
Because does it, when God's law conflicts with the laws of man, we have to obey God's law, right? Uh, so, so his relationship with God was more important than this this uh, relationship with the king, and he had to obey God's law and and pray to his God. I will ask this question: Why didn't he close the windows <laughs> so nobody could see him? Because he probably never had before. Yeah. He wasn't well, ashamed he now, and then he wouldn't get in trouble. But, yeah. He wasn't ashamed. He knew God would take care of it if something did happen. Yeah, I, I just think that a lot of times we uh, uh, we think to ourselves, if as long as I hide my Christianity, I'll be okay. As long as no one knows, uh, no one will abuse me. Uh, Daniel was not that way, right? He was very open, very clear about what he believed. He left the windows open. He understood that people might actually see what he was doing. But again, his relationship to God was more important uh, than what people thought about him. I'm afraid we fall into the camp of uh, we would have closed the windows uh, in order to to keep ourselves uh, out of trouble. Uh, we would we would have rationalized. Hey, listen, I'm still praying. I'm still praying three times a day. I'm still praying towards Jerusalem. What's the big deal whether my windows are open or not? Right. We have a way of rationalizing uh, to, to keep ourselves out of trouble. It's all about self-interest and self-serving, et cetera. So I just want to point that out. Right. All right. Uh, let's go on to verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplications before God. So, yeah, they didn't just happen upon Daniel right there waiting. They know what's going to happen. They knew he was uh, he was a religious man. They knew he was he prayed to God every day. So they're sitting there waiting for him. Uh, Daniel prays and he sees it. And then in verse 12, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the alliance? And the king falls right into their trap, right? The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which does not alter, right? So he has set himself up. And so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the, de <clears throat> or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So just look at the language of this, right? You know, that Daniel, you know, that, that Daniel, that captive, that guy who who came in as a foreigner, you know, uh, you know, he uh, you've put him in charge of a bunch of stuff, but he's just a captive. He's just a foreigner. You know, that Daniel, I can just hear the, the language dripping off of their lips as they say this, uh, trying to derise uh, Daniel in front of them. They, they just um, uh, they love uh, doing this. And then, you know, in the midst of it, they, they show a, uh, a misrepresentation of his attentions. Right. He says. He does not show due regard for you, right? He's saying, um, you know, Daniel obviously does not regard you, does not think much of you as king, and, and he's just slapping you in the face by doing this prayer thing. I, I just think we see the same thing in the world today when they, when a Christian does something, all of a sudden they misrepresent the intentions, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, you don't go out drinking with the guys at work, and so all of a sudden you're not a team player. Right? Or, or you, you're not uh, you're not doing what's expected of you because uh, you, you know you're somehow uh, honoring your God. So I think kind of misrepresenting intentions is, is something that that happens very regularly. And we see that it happens here to Daniel. Then we have verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until the going down of the sun to deliver him. This is kind of a fascinating verse, right? Uh, that 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 the king doesn't blame the uh, the governors. He doesn't blame Daniel. He blames himself, right? That he was displeased with himself, or he was upset with himself. Um, the the word there is uh, he felt rotten, is uh, is actually the translation of the correct word. He felt rotten about himself, and so then he sets his heart on Daniel. He he tries to figure out a way. How do I get Daniel out of this? Uh, where's there a glitch in the law that I can say, hey? Uh, let's let Daniel go. We can't. Uh, we can't be throwing him into the the pit of lions. He labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So one thing you need to understand about the the laws of the visas of the Persians was once they uh, uh, once they found out someone had done something wrong and there was a punishment for it, uh, they were supposed to kill him before the end of the day. 
uh, that punishment was supposed to be carried out before the end of the day. So it says here he labored until this, you know, the sun went down because that's all the time he had. This wasn't like, uh, you know, we could stall for a couple of weeks and see if we could figure something out. He had till the end of the day to figure this out. And, uh, and, and so he's, he's trying to figure it out, but uh, you'll see he doesn't come up with anything. So then in verse 15, right, then these men approached the king and said to the king, no king that is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed, right? So they're throwing it back in his face, reminding him, you can't just wait uh, until tomorrow. You got to take care of this tonight. So verse 16, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke to Daniel, saying to the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, will deliver you. So, so first of all, they cast him into the den, den of lions. So uh, they typically had lions around for fun, uh, recreation. Uh, you know, they had a zoo, as we've talked about before. Uh, they had a den where these lions were. And it appears that, uh, you know, they cast him into it. And in some way, they threw him into this lion, lion's den from above or, or some elevated position where they could see into it. Not, not dissimilar from the uh, fiery furnace that we uh, have seen in, in uh, chapters past. They throw him into this line, they cast him in. And remember now, this guy's 90 years old. Let's not forget that. And they throw him into this den of lions. And then there's, again, this amazing statement at the end of the verse, right? Uh, Your God, whom you serve continually, will deliver you. Um, I, I, I want to think that the, that the king is really nice here and that he's thinking, you know, Daniel's going to deliver him. I, I think that you could also read this as go, you know, your God, whom you serve continually, in other words, if you didn't serve him continually, you wouldn't be in this trouble, right? So there may be a little derision in what the king is saying here. It's kind of unclear whether uh, he, he is, but he certainly understands that Daniel has a God and that God, Daniel's God is served continually, right? And and he's saying that, you know, hopefully he will deliver you. He may deliver you. Uh, it depends on the translation that you have, whether it's a, 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 a definitive or whether you're saying he may do Anyway, so he makes the statement, and then in verse 17, then the, the stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the signets of the lords, that, uh, that the purpose concerning Daniel might be done. So, so they roll a, roll a stole, stone over the entrance of this pit, and then they seal it and, uh, and, and seal it with the signet ring of the king and with the signet ring of the lords or the, the governors uh, who were with him. So, so I got to ask the question, why did both of them seal the tomb? Why did the king seal it? And why did the Lord seal it? I think they didn't trust the king that he might try. I think the Lords did not trust the king because he really favored Daniel, obviously, from what he said. They're afraid he might go and slip in, get some of his men to, you know, to move the rock and get Daniel out of there. Okay, so that's why the Lord sealed it. Why did the king seal it? Because it was an official act. Yeah. And so that, they were, that he was carrying out the provisions of his own edict. Yeah, if you look at the end of the verse, though, right, that the purpose can Daniel, concerning Daniel might not be changed, I think there's a little bit of, uh, he was worried that the Lord's might go in and kill Daniel. <laughs> right? Kill Daniel. If the lions didn't get him, they were going to go ahead and kill him. Uh, then the lions, of course, would eat him up. Uh, so I think there's a fear on both of the hands, uh, one on the lords that the king might let him go, on the part of the king that the lords might actually go in there and kill him. Uh, both of those things are going on, so they both sealed it such that nothing could actually be changed. All right, verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no mu musicians were brought before him, and also his sleep went from him. Uh, so he had a restless night, right? He couldn't sleep. Uh, he didn't eat. Uh, the mind where it says musicians, uh, uh, you could also say diversions. Uh, some of the translations actually say no concubines were brought to him. So he, he had nothing, no kind of recreation in the evening, if you will, uh, uh, while, while this was going on. So that would be normal, right? Normally he would have some kind of, uh, he would have a meal, he would have recreation, and he would sleep well, but all those things were taken from him uh, before uh, on this particular night. He had a, a very uh, unusual and restless night. So then early in the morning, next uh, verse 19, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the, to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, 
The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? So he gets up early. He runs to the den. He has this lamenting voice, uh, this voice of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned and upset. Uh, I, I really think you're dead, Daniel, but I'm going to. I'm going to uh, uh, make this statement, you know, Daniel, servant of the living God, which is kind of an amazing statement that uh, that Darius would say, right? Servant of the living God, that's an unusual, again, that would have to be something that he heard from Daniel. Daniel would have to have spoken of his God as the living God uh, for Darius to have said such a thing. It wouldn't be a normal thing for someone who was a, a Babylonian or, or, uh, or a Median Persian to come up with. Has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? It, it's interesting. Uh, he asked this question, you know, is your God able to deliver you from the lions? It would have been nice if he had asked that before he threw him into the lions, then, right? But here, <clears throat> kind of after the fact, you know, is your God able to deliver you? Which is the fundamental question, right? Is the key question, is your God able? Is your God able to deliver you from the lions? You know, you know, you can go into the New Testament and see where the lions are often associated with the devil, right? Uh, you, uh, Rome's about as a lion seeking whom he can devour. So th this question about is your God able to deliver you from Satan? Is your God able to deliver you from the lions that prowl, from the troubles that are in your life, from the things that are going on, kind of is the fundamental question uh, that, that, uh, that the world wants to know uh, about us, right? Is our God able to deliver us? Uh, from from this uh, these things that uh, attack our lives. <clears throat> and then we have verse 21. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. So I, I find this, again, hilarious, too. So Daniel's down in the lion's den. He's been throwing down there. There's a bunch of lions, right? Um, and, and the king comes, you know, says, hey, has your, has your God been able to live you? I'm not sure my response would have been, O king, live forever. I might have been upset. <laughs> I might have been angry. I might have had some choice words to say to the king uh, about what he had done. And even if I had been delivered, right, I, you know, I would have, might have given him the nanny, nanny, boo, boo, right, uh, that I'm still alive uh, kind of thing. But, but he doesn't. He has great respect still for the king. Right? He doesn't lose his character even in the midst of victory. Right? He doesn't lose his character in the midst of uh, trouble, but he also doesn't lose his character in the midst of victory. I, I think that's a very important statement. He doesn't he doesn't uh, show it show a pride uh, over over the king at this point in time. <clears throat> and then in verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have not done I have done no wrong before you. So two things that Daniel says here: uh, first of all, he shuts the lion's mouth. But then, because I was found innocent before God. God saw that I was innocent and there was no reason for me to die. And so he did not allow the lions to, to uh, attack me. But then also, I have not, I, I've done no wrong before you. So, so interestingly, this is the first time that Daniel has said anything in this whole uh, chapter, right? He's not, he's not responded to the king at all. When the king said, uh, you know, you've done this thing wrong, you, you disobeyed me, these people brought charges against them, no response from Daniel until now. Until God has delivered him, until God has shown that he is innocent, then he can say to the king, now you can see that I'm innocent. Now the proof is, is there. And I can show you that I've done nothing wrong uh, even to you. I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I haven't skipped anything. Okay, I haven't. Good. So verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. So I just got to pause here. Daniel is, uh, uh, is in the den. The, the lions don't hurt him. Um, and, and, he, and he makes this statement at the end of verse 23. He, nothing happened, no injury, whatever was found in him because he believed in his God. No, no, nothing was, nothing went wrong with Daniel because he believed in his God. So is this a general statement that, is, that says, if we believe in God, nothing wrong will go 
happen to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we got to be clear about that, right? Uh, you know, we've got in, in the whole book, the whole story about uh, through this book, right? They were thrown in the fiery furnace, they're not burnt. They're thrown at the lions, they're not killed. Um, if it's not that when we depend upon God, nothing bad will happen to us, what is the story? What, what is the message? That if it's his will, that God can save us from whatever trials or tribulations come. True. He could have kept him from even going in the fiery furnace or going in the den, but he chose not to and showed that he was with him through the through the trials. True. And God's in control. So what's the worst case scenario for Daniel here? He gets mauled. He dies. <laughs> he gets eaten by lions, right? That's a, that's a pretty simple question. He gets eaten by the lions. So if he does get eaten by the lions, what's the next thing that happens? Rejoins with God. Yeah, right? I mean, he's got an angel down there keeping the keeping the lions' uh, mouths shut. So if he gets eaten by the lions, that same angel is there to take him into the fellowship with God, right? So I think from Daniel's perspective, what's the worst that can happen to me? I'm going to go and be with God. I'm 90 years old. This is going to be a fun day for me, right? I, I, again, I think this this perspective about, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess the way I say it is, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? Uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be killed. I'm, you know, we 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 blow everything up in our minds as a lion's den kind of experience, right? Oh my gosh, I'm going to be eaten by lions. You know, but really, what is the worst thing? Uh, our pride is going to get hurt. Uh, someone's going to say something bad against us. Uh, I, I won't get that promotion. Uh, I won't be looked on with favor in the community, right? Um, for Daniel, it really was the lion's den. He might actually have been eaten by lions. But even in that, he said, well, God is going to be with me. God's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about, uh, the, you know, what happens in the end of this thing. So, again, the whole story is about is about his, his faithfulness to God. The whole story is about God. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in, in, a, in a few minutes. But just see it here. I just want to make sure you're not trapped in that uh, that place of, well, if I just believe more, if I just believe better, then certainly I won't be eaten by the lions. That's not the point of the story. All right, verse 24. And the king gave a command. Yeah. And the king gave a command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So there are those people who hear the story about Daniel and the lions, and they say, you know, maybe the lions weren't hungry, right? Maybe they had already fed them and they weren't hungry. Or maybe Daniel hid in the corner, right? Or maybe he, he battled off the lions, all of which are insanity, right? When you see this whole horde of people that get thrown into the lion's den here and get eaten before they even hit the ground. <laughs> this is what it says, right? So there was no, the, they were, these were some hungry, ferocious lions who were not going to let somebody uh, live just because the, they weren't hungry or they were docile or Clarence the cross-eyed lion or something. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have that here. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let's go on to verse 25. So then we have this amazing proclamation. Let me just read it, and then we'll talk about it. It says, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the, all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So it's kind of an amazing uh, proclamation that the king makes here. Now, as we said uh, uh, back a couple of chapters ago, when we had a similar proclamation from Nebuchadnezzar, it's very likely that Daniel wrote this proclamation, right? Because the words in it are very, uh, very Jewish. <laughs> uh, the, you know, again, him saying that he is the, of the living God, uh, that he lasts forever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he shall not be destroyed. Um, th- th- these are all kind of things that it's very likely that Daniel wrote for the king. But 
it's kind of amazing that the king would sign such a proclamation. Right? He's just learned not to sign everything that comes before him, right? He's learned not to be Radar O'Reilly, right? Not not just sign the papers, uh, you know, that, that Radar brings them to you, right? But um, sorry, I, I don't know why I'm bringing these weird references there as well. But he's he's learned not to do that uh, just just because what he just gone through. So he certainly read this and understood it and believed it to some sense uh, before signing it and making this proclamation. It's kind of an amazing uh, statement that he says that you know he's going to. That he's the God who have a kingdom that lasts forever, and, uh, and 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 that he has these kinds of characteristics. All right, and so then verse twenty-eight, we end it with uh, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So again, whether that's one person or two people or uh, a governor underneath the king is uh, is uncertain, but he certainly prospered during that reign um, as long as he lived. Uh, now I want to I want to actually step back again uh, now that we've kind of read the story and talk about a couple things. Uh, um, the the theme of this story and frankly the theme of the whole first six chapters um, is not about how wonderful Daniel is, how great Daniel is, right? It, it really is about how wonderful and how great God is. So I think sometimes we get in this perspective about thinking, well, Daniel was just an amazing person. Daniel was so incredible. Look at what Daniel did. But you really got to get your eyes on what God has done through Daniel, right? What God has done in delivering him and delivering the, the three young men, right, in, in the, the handwriting on the wall, all those things that God did uh, is, the, is the real theme of the because, because Daniel constantly gives glory to God. Uh, it, it's about glorifying God. It's not about glorifying Daniel. Uh, so, so I would I would say that it's not for us to try to be more like Daniel. It's it's really for us to try to understand our God more, uh, for us to really understand who God is more. That that really should be the overriding message of of the book. So, what I want to do um, back in uh, in chapter two when we looked at uh, the story there, <clears throat> we, we kind of summarized some of the character qualities of Daniel. I want to go back through this story and look at look at the character qualities that we see in Daniel. Now I'm going to do this, even though I just said don't focus on Daniel. It's all about God. I want to show you these character qualities because you'll see in it then uh, how he, he focuses on God. All right, so the first thing I want to say is that <clears throat> um, Daniel always uh, looked beyond his circumstances. I, I wrote down in my notes here, he, he transcended history. He, he wasn't about what was going on in his life right now. He understood there was something in the future. He understood there was something more outside of the, the realm of the Babylonians, right? It was all about God. It was about what was going on in the bigger sphere. So he wasn't focused on the here and now. He was focused on something a lot larger than that. Second thing is he lived a consistent life from youth to old age. Um, he, it wasn't a, a faith that comes and goes. Um, Sometimes I've asked the question, uh, even in this class, um, what, can you think back to a time when your faith was stronger, when you were a stronger Christian? And unfortunately, uh, uh, that is often true. When I was more fired up, I was, uh, you know, more trying to do what God wanted me to do, right? Uh, you can't say that about Daniel. He was consistent throughout his whole life, and that ought to be something we ought to try to be. It's just more consistent in the way that we live, uh, live towards God. Um, thirdly, he fulfilled his calling, right? He, he lived in the center of God's will all the time. I got to say, some of these things I'm saying are, are sometimes just rewording the same things, but, but he lived in the center of God's will. He, he, was, he was always uh, trying to do what God wanted to do and not worried about the consequences. Nextly, he, he always had the right attitude. Oh, my goodness. In the midst of all the things that happened to him, uh, you never saw him railing against the king. You never saw him railing against his captives. You never saw him whining and complaining, right? Uh, he was always focused on God and on, on what God was doing and on putting his hand, his life in God's hand. Um, it, another way to say this is uh, he was hated by the world, but he was never embittered by it, right? He never got bitter because of the things that happened to him. And the things that happened to him, I mean, he was he first did it. At, at a teenager was ripped from his family and his home and brought into Babylon. And then life became worse after that. Right. Um, but he was never embittered by all of that. Um, the only thing that they could content, condemn him of was his righteousness. 
right? The only thing that they could find wrong with him was that he was righteous, that he followed after God. Uh, what a uh, what a rule and a mark for us to, to try to live up to. The only thing that could be found wrong with us was our righteousness itself. He was, he was known for his virtue and his integrity, even among his enemies, right? They, they understood that the only thing we could bring against him uh, was his relationship to God. So that his virtue, his integrity was, were known even by his enemies. He was a he was a faithful citizen until the law asked him to violate the laws of God. Right? He was very much uh, he helped the king. He worked with the king. He did the stuff for the king. He worked within the system as much as he could. He was very faithful in in being a citizen until the point uh, that the, that conflicted with the law of God, and then he had to make a stand. But don't miss that he was a very faithful citizen all the time before that. As we've said, he was he was willing to, to face any consequences within the framework of God's will and leave the outcome to God. Right? He was willing to face the consequence, and leave the outcome to God, whatever that might be. What's the worst that can happen, right? Um, he was uh, maybe said another way, but he was willing to serve faithfully no matter what the costs were to him personally. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about what might happen to him. It wasn't about his reputation. You also see that he never defends himself. He leaves that to God, right? He's never sticking up for Daniel, saying, oh, what about Daniel? What about Daniel? No, he just leaves that part to God. The other thing is he strengthens the faith of others around him. You see that with the three young men that were with him. But here, you even see it with the king, right? The king has, uh, you saw that Nebuchadnezzar who kind of, got a better understanding of God uh, as he grew uh, in, in working with Daniel. You certainly see this in, in Cyrus here, or Cyrus or Darius here as he writes this, this proclamation. So everybody is influenced by, by Daniel because of uh, the way that he lives this life. Um, he is delivered from harm. He's preserved for every purpose within the will of God. I guess the way I've said this before is um, I, I you cannot be killed unless God decides, right? Uh, I, I, I am, uh, I, I am uh, what's it, invincible. I am absolutely invincible until God decides otherwise. And he, that's actually how he lived his life. He, you know, he, he knew, understood he was invincible unless God took him out. And that was perfectly fine with him. That's how he lived his life. Um, bless you. Bless you. Three of them. Four. Okay. Um, the other thing, he saw himself as a vehicle for God's glory, right? He lived his life as a vehicle for God's glory. Uh, his life was not about Daniel's glory. It was about God's glory. He understood that he would be avenged by God. His enemies would be dealt with by God. He didn't have to deal with them. He didn't have to, uh, you know, pray for them to be destroyed, right? He, he, was, he, he understood that that was God's job. And, and, and in the end, uh, he's exalted uh, not only by those around him, but by God himself, right, in, in, in the way that uh, the things that happened to him. So, so I think we've seen kind of an amazing uh, set of characteristics in Daniel. I just wanted to capture those for you just in this one story. You add those to what we had uh, back in Chapter 2. It's kind of an amazing list uh, for us to, to strive for. Uh, again, uh, not so much to be like Daniel, but uh, he, was a, he was a man who understood who God was. And, uh, and and lived according to that. Okay, so as I said, next week we kind of leave the historical record, uh, the stories of Daniel, and we look at um, we look at some of the visions of Daniel and the prophecy. And so we'll be getting into discussions on the end times and uh, all that fun stuff that everybody likes to study. Uh, that's totally confusing, and uh, we will uh, we will have uh, we will have fun with it as we get into it. Uh, and dive into to chapter seven next week. But right, anything before we close, any comments or thoughts with regard to Daniel and his lions? Okay, listen, y'all have a great week. Uh, let me just pray for you before we go. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to uh, to to learn as we've looked at these stories uh, in the first six chapters of Daniel, uh, Father, to, to hear about the, the, the amazing things that you did, how you stepped into history, how you just, uh, you do hold the king's lives in your hands, Father, 
you hold the rulers' lives in your hands. You're, you held all this politics and all this stuff going on, Father. It's all within your control. And, and, and Lord, help us to just be more cognizant of that. Help us to be more dependent upon you and, and just trust, Lord, that you've got it in control. When it seems to be out of control, you've got it in control, Father, uh, because you've got a completely different uh, perspective on, on all the things that are going on, whether that's in the government uh, or, Father, uh, even in our lives, Father, as things go on, that, that you are in charge, you're in control, and that uh, we can trust you even in the midst of what, what might be some strange times, Father. But we just ask you to be with us as we go into the worship time. We we uh, ask you to be with the speaker, Father, and we just ask you that we can bring away something uh, about relationships that will be important to us. We just thank you now, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all have a good week. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Bye. 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 Bye.